Oh my goodness. <laughs> I've made it here. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean that in a couple of ways. One is that uh, this is, a, you know, this is a kind of little gold star in the psychedelic world if you're invited to Horizons. And the other is a few months ago um, when I was in the emergency room um, while they were deciding what to do with my heart, one of my concerns was, was I going to make it to Horizons? So uh, it's wonderful to be here in lots of ways. <laughs> and some of you I know have experimented uh, with enough substances so that you've died. But it's different when you're in the ER. <laughs> and you're not on anything. <laughs> so I was, um, the, I, I was, I kind of did the squarest bio I could, just in case other people were reading it. Um, but I'm really, have done a lot more interesting things and all that stuff. And one of the things I wanted to talk about today, um, and this is, this is a kind of against the way the research is going, but it's, it's the next step, which is we need to begin to let go of the medical model um, while the medical model continues to do what it does. And uh, just a couple of small commercials before I do that. One is, yes, I also have a book called The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. Safe, Therapeutic, and Sacred Journeys, which suggests my point of view. And the word therapeutic was uh, thrown in by my publisher. I just wanted safe and sacred. But therapeutic is that kind of middle ground, which is what do you do after you've discovered that you're divine and immortal? And then you come down. And you find, much to your amazement, that you're in the same body with the same personality and the same dysfunctional family. <laughs> so there is definitely a place for therapeutic. The other thing I did want to mention, since uh, I'm not often in New York, is those of you not able to get to the MAPS party tonight, um, if you are open, uh, the Open Center, which is 22 East 30th Street, I'm, I'm the evening. So if we don't finish with q and I'll see some of you at Open Center tonight. So the problem with a medical model is twofold. One is you have to be ill to start. And so if you look at most of the research studies, except for the John Hopkins spiritual work, um, you not only have to be ill, but you have to be ill with something fairly awful. And since most of you don't fit that model, um, sometimes I ask a group, uh, how many of you are going to be in a legal research study next year? Including not me. How many of you are planning to have a psychedelic within the next year? So I'll talk to you. <laughs> and if you think about the medical model for a moment, it's really a pharmacological model that says, you put a substance into the body, it changes stuff, and then eventually it leaves the body, and the changes all stop. And if you want those changes, you do it again. And if you think of aspirin, diuretics, antidepressants, etc., they're all based on the model that basically you don't, nothing happens for the whole system there may be a gradual shift, but basically we're talking about kind of biochemistry in, biochemistry out. And then the fact of the matter, and we know it's a fact because it was done in research, that if you ask, say, people who've taken psilocybin once or twice for spiritual purposes, a year later, excitement, excitement, they show changes. Now. Do they show changes because of a change in their biochemistry? It's plausible, but unlikely. What they do show a change is what's called learning. And learning, if you remember, if you've learned something that mattered, you don't know it, you know it, and you keep knowing it. And that's really a different model. And it's a little hard when you're thinking about research 
to squeeze it inside the medical model so that you can get the approval of all the agencies who are in the medical model when your interest is in the actual model, which is a learning model. Um, and when we talk about long-lasting effects, there's a wonderful bit of film of someone who took LSD once in a supportive, safe, guided setting 40 years ago. And he was a serious, awful alcoholic, you know, losing his family, losing his job, losing his health. And he had one session. Forty years later, he was interviewed and asked about what's happened to him in alcohol in 40 years. And he said, oh, I haven't had a drink in 40 years. And there was something in the filmmaker saying, gee, willpower. And the man laughs and said, no, no interest. That's learning. Okay, And we don't know much about what that learning means, but we sure can see the results. So what happens in um, serious psychedelic work is there's a sudden reframing of massive amounts of worldview. And then you say, well, I don't remember all that happened, but I do know that it did happen, and I do know that my worldview will never be the same. And that's why, probably why most of you are here. Now, again, one more aside. Um, it says in the, in the write-up of what I'm going to talk about that you're going to get a chance to participate in research. And no, I'm not going to have a spray atomizer. We leave that for the CIA's kind of many, many failed experiments. But you will get a chance to participate in, a, in the next phase of some research that we've, a team of us have been working on for a few years, which is to find out more about what's happened for you. Uh, because it turns out that if you go through the last 40 years from when research, you know, laboratory research stopped till now, um, the information about us, except how many of you have taken something, is zero which is fairly extraordinary given that 23 million people have taken LSD during that period, and that 400 to 600,000 people this year will try it for the first time. It's hard to think of a population that large that has eluded government research. And it may be that if you really are determined not to fund something, you can not learn anything about it. But we've found very cheap ways to do research, and you're part of it. And if you don't want to be part of the research, fill it out anyway. Just put in a false name, because we won't be using your name anyway. So what, what I realized at some point, um, after research was stopped in the 60s, is for a long time I thought, oh, I can't do the research that interests me the most that's the most life-changing, that has the most potential. But then I also realized at a deeper level, and I'm so glad that, that we have Roy here, is that what the government had also said is we are restricting some basic freedoms. And I've tried to look at what are basic enough freedoms so that you can talk about it in general and then have psychedelics as a special case. And one is called religious freedom. And the question is, can you you know, can you go into most any group from tea parties on, on one end to us, I think we're probably on the other, and say, um, is religious freedom something that we support in this country? And the answer usually is yes. And therefore, the next step up from that is, is it all right to establish or reestablish or discover your connection to the divine? And once you get an affirmation of that, then you say, can I use my own religious system? And then here we are. So I'm really very interested in the restoration of religious freedom. I'm also interested in the restoration of scientific freedom. That it seems to me there's a general belief that it's OK to discover how the universe works. It's OK, you know, we build a hundred billion dollar machine that, that basically makes atoms go really fast and then hurts them. 
because we'd like to know, you know, what's inside those little tight little spheres and so forth. And similarly, are we interested in discovering uh, a lot of how the world works? And what's nice is that one can use psychedelics for scientific exploration. And scientific exploration uh, is basically discovery, not only of yourself, that's a different set of issues, but of how the material world works. And as the government was shutting everyone down, we were working with senior scientists coming in with hard scientific problems of chip design and, and architecture, um, biology, basic physics, theory of the photon, things that you might, from your own personal experience, say, gee, I don't know if I was using a psychedelic where that was what I'd want to do with the evening. But under a special set and setting and with people who care, the answer is yes. And the nice thing is we have at the moment, only two Nobel Prize winners who've copped to the fact of where they got their ideas. But it suggests that scientific freedom is a useful notion. And again, you know, the medical model just has nothing to say. Okay? You don't say to a Nobel Prize winner, uh, before you go into the lab, I want to do, you know, a blood test. And to make sure that there's nothing in your blood except what I, the examiner, may have in my blood, except these days the examiner may not be, may have had an interesting Saturday night as well. And then there's personal freedom, which is do you have the right to explore your own psychodynamics, your own, your own uh, way of looking at the world, your own memories? Let's hope this holds. My head seems to be shrinking and the mic is the same size. And that's really the question of, is it OK to do something that leads to your own self-healing and improves your connection to the natural world? Now, obviously, you know, if we get to vote, we know where we stand. But again, those were the freedoms that were taken away. The freedom to explore the divine, the freedom, freedom to explore the world, and the freedom to explore yourself. Okay. It seems to me as we move forward and the research at all, you know, whatever level it is, continues, we need to keep in mind that's that may be where we're headed. Okay, that we're not necessarily going to be content if um, certain psychedelics are available on prescription. That's not about the same levels of freedom I'm talking about. Now uh, are we likely to achieve that first in the United States? No. Okay. So that's, that's the kind of basic frame that, that I'd like to suggest to you to be thinking about as we move forward. Because also in your personal lives, that's more likely. Since, as we've pointed out, you're not going to be in those research studies. And given the serious physical conditions that most of them demand, that's terrific. But you are going to be in all those other situations of looking at yourself, science, and the divine. So that's one piece. Another piece which I've found is, is a reminder, but a, ne a necessary reminder, is what is necessary for the safest, most successful, and potentially sacred experience. And when I started doing this book, it came out of, I started to do a memoir of all the interesting people I'd known and not taken drugs with and taken drugs with. And I was absolutely charmed by all my interesting self until I had this epiphany that said, who else is? And it was smaller than my Christmas card list. So then I said, well, what do I know that people might want to learn about? And so that's what the book is really for. And <coughs> what it includes in, in, in core piece is what are the, ne the necessary things to have in order to ensure the best possible time for you between ingesting a psychedelic and the next morning or the next afternoon if you're into all night events. And the answer is very simply six items, 
and they're very straightforward and most of you know them. Um, but just kind of go through your own inner checklist, which is main, you know, and, and turns out most important is what's called set, or what's your mental attitude, expectations, intention, and, the, and obviously it turns out the better and easier and safer and more happy and more centered you are, the more likely your experience is going to be in that way. One of, the, one of the reasons I think that I'm more interested in LSD than in many other substances, um, my friend Peter Webster describes it, is LSD has the least noise, meaning it has the least other effects, meaning physical effects, of any of the substances. And that's partly because we're dealing in micrograms and perhaps just the nature of the molecule. But if you think of your own mental set, your own expectation, it turns out to be huge. Okay? Setting, which is the situation in which you find yourself. And one of the pieces of research that we've done is we basically said to people, let me just ask you briefly, have you ever had a bad trip? Hands, please. Okay. Do you know why it was a bad trip? Hands, please. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, less hands. Okay. So one of the things that we found is set, and then setting, which is what's the situation? What's the literal physical situation you're in? And I come out of the, the school that says um, comfortable, safe, temperature controlled, a, good headphones for music or earbuds, and availability if possible to nature. Uh, Albert Hoffman who you all know, says, always take it in nature, which seems to me reasonable given his point of view, which is that's the way he works. Um, but the setting turns out to be very critical. And when we, we kind of looked over some of our, our comments about what caused a bad trip, um, uh, bad, uh, you know, kind of bad setting, uh, people who didn't turn out to be friends. My favorite was the session was going pretty well till the car caught on fire. <laughs> so setting is important. Uh, then, um, to, to the extent that a lot of people dismiss me as a radical conservative, which is kind of fun in this crowd, um, is I think guides are wonderful. I think guides are wonderful if you, you know, if you ever want to take up scuba diving, you want someone to, to be your guide. If you want to learn, remember when you learned to drive a car? You had a guide. If you, you know, you don't go down to the airport and you say, I want to fly a plane. And he says, well, here's some keys, pick one of those and give it a shot. Is you have to actually do some learning, you have to do some training, you have to help, you get guided. And they don't let you fly on your own until after you've been guided. So my figuring is that's important. On the other side of it is how valuable is a psychedelic experience? And is it worth going to the trouble of having a guide? Early study, 100 people, single session, guided, moderately high dose, three, 400 mics. 78% said it was, if not, you know, one of the most, if not the most, single important experience of their entire lives. So if you're dealing with something that has that potential, maybe it's worth putting a little time and energy into it, and maybe it's worth having a guide. Now, again, being on the ultra-conservative side, for me, a guide is someone who is not taking material. Now, those of you who worked with shamans, some shamans work, take a small amount of material, some take a lot. Uh, shamans who have 20 years of, of training, you know, whatever they do is fine. But for the rest of us, Think about having a guide. Substance, obviously important. What are you taking? How much? And it turns out, uh, when I put together this book, the last possible way I would have ever organized it was by dose. But it turns out dose is important. And then the session itself is how are things going? And then the other is the situation, which is what kind of life space are you going back into? Are you going back into a world where people will say, 
you shouldn't have done that, you're crazy, you're a bad person, or you're going back into a situation that says, oh yeah, and I did. And then you, you, know, you talk about your experiences. It makes a real difference. So best practices, and it's different if you're doing it for creative problem solving, personal exploration, spiritual experience. Now, I wanted to just touch briefly on uh, new work, and I'm gonna hand out at this point, if I have volunteers and we have those one-page um, forms, love those handed out, so during Q&A you can fill them out and we're going to be very grateful. And my, my colleague, Sophia Korb, is here. Um, and we're, we may, if there are questions about that during Q&A, she's gonna help me. But the other thing I wanted to talk about, which many of you have not heard about, is what's called microdosing. How many of you have heard about microdosing? Whoa! Okay. Uh, do you know how much research there is published on microdosing? There's a little teeny bit in my book. That's it. Um, but microdosing, which is in the LSD world, 10 micrograms, in the psilocybin world, if it's mushrooms, about a fifth of what you would think is a hit, and so forth, turns out to be a totally different world, and mainly the world is that there are no what we would call psychedelic effects. As someone said, the rocks don't glow even a little. But what many people are reporting, and, and I've got people around the country sending me kind of journals of their microdose life, is that at the end of the day you say, that was a really good day. You know that kind of a day when things kind of work, you have something that's a little troubling but you handle it well, you, you're doing a task that you normally would, would, couldn't stand for more than two hours and you do it for three or four, and you eat perhaps properly and you maybe do one more set of reps. Just a good day. That seems to be what we're discovering, and Albert Hoffman said it is the most, it's the under-researched area of psychedelics, which he was aware of it. And according to uh, impeccable sources, uh, it's what he did. And so there is a theory, if you're interested in living to 102, and being able to give long lectures at 101, microdosing might be a part of that, and again, um, we're looking to do, you know, large-scale research the way they do on a pharmaceutical, where we have, you know, 45,000 women under the age of such and such taking it for five years and so forth. So we're looking at that. So that's that's a kind of very quick overview of what what I'm working with and what it's about. And I think we'll probably do better in Q and A because my guess is as is truer and truer, um, this is going to become this, you know, explorer's guide as if, you know, as if I know a lot. Uh, the more I hang out with more of you, the, the more I learn that you already know and you're way ahead in terms of your adventures. So in the Q&A, just a few, few things, or not Q&A, but discussion, <clears throat> two things. Do not please say, I had this experience, and then we know you're going to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. We had that experience too, okay? <laughs> and the other is, if it's a question, and I know that this seems a little simple-minded, but you'd be amazed at how many people don't know this. A question is a single sentence with maybe a clause or two, and your voice goes up a little at the end. Because okay, I've been in a lot of places where people think a question means this is the chance to sell you on my version of divinity or product or ideological stance. And the other thing to keep in mind is there are two fundamentally cultural changing meetings occurring in New York today. We're one, and the other is in a small park not too far from here. And Dorothy and I, my wife, visited yesterday, and it felt very much like us in terms of kindness, in terms of caring for each other, in terms of self-support, and with an opinion. And the fact that it is making a, 
of a statement worldwide uh, suggests that in some sense a lot of what many of us have come to believe in is also understood even at a political level. So it's really wonderful to be in New York for two of the best possible meetings that I could attend. Okay, let's, thank you. So you have your uh, comment sheet. Um, this is kind of loud. Hey Jim, thank you, oh, with five minutes to spare no less. Um, so we're going to open the floor now to questions and discussion and uh, anybody have something they'd like to say? Gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, one quick comment, one quick question. Um, comment is, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, about microdosing that you would run large studies like the pharmaceutical companies do, you know, enrolling women under the age of 40. It interestingly sounds like a medical model <laughs> approach to microdosing, which is which is fine. But that's I'd like you to comment on on that relative to your earlier comments about the limitations of the medical model. And then uh, number two. When you talked about the, 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 the three freedoms that we're losing, personal freedom, scientific freedom, and religious freedom, um, it's interesting that uh, what was probably um, maybe you could comment on a missing piece would be like what people use drugs for, for pleasure, or because it feels good. Ah, I, I, thank you, thank you. I have a tendency to forget recreational use. And I know all of you now just, I just dropped about, I know, I know you don't like me as much. <laughs> But, but pleasure uh, is one of the few incredible discoveries that the United States has created for psychedelics. We have 7,000 years of psychedelic use in you know, dozens of cultures, and no one ever came up with dropping and lying around with new country. It is our sole contribution to the world history of psychedelic use. And there is like one line in my book that says, I'm not going to talk about it because there's too much out there already. And whatever I say, someone's going to say, nah, you don't need to. So it's a, it is an important comment. It is the, obviously the largest use. And in some sense, I'm thinking that if you think concerts and recreational is good, and theogenic is another world entirely, and don't miss it. Because these substances, as far as the plants tell us, we're not created for recreational use. That's kind of something we found out on our own. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sophia. I work with Jim. Um, I just wanted to know if you wanted to comment on what we found the two studies ago with the grids and the motivations. Okay. Um, we asked um, a huge, sorry, uh, we asked a huge group of people. It may have been this group of people or a different group. Um, what drugs you took for which purposes? Um, and it was a totally unsuccessful study because everyone said that they took each drug that they had taken, they take they had taken for all of the reasons. So I, I think it brings up an interesting question to what human motivation is, or looking back on our experience, we're like, oh, that was fun, but um, I think we're still sort of trying to tease some of that out as we go. Yeah, we're really trying to find out such basic things mainly because we want other people to know about them and we're also it turns out you know when i said 23 million people have taken lnc that's just lnc if we had ecstasy we get another bump and if we had marijuana we're up to 140 million so there's half the population that doesn't know what we're talking about so they will eventually be our audience. But for now, if we can just reach the 140 million, we're doing all right. But we're trying to reach it for each other. Yes, please. Um, one of the more famous experiments on LSD that I've heard about was something known as the Good Friday experiment. Yes. And I understand that there was a follow-up done many years later. Is, can you talk about that at all and tell me what the all results were? Well, um, at the risk of doing it wrong, because Rick, who did the, who did the follow up, is here. Um, Walter Tanky, 25 years ago, a bunch of people having a church service. Upstairs, everyone was in the regular church service. And downstairs, the, the service was being piped in, but half the people were on the psychedelics and half weren't. And much to no one's surprise, the people who weren't pretty soon learned that was true. 
And a lot of people had a lot of amazing safe experiences. And then 25 years later, a number of those people were tracked down. And what we know in general is they were not only fine, but it has made a major, for many of them, major difference in their lives, in their theological lives, and in their theological profession. And so, again, one of those long-term, long-term benefit studies. Uh, and again, um, as you know, in, in Christianity, you know, if you take a, you know, the people have conversion experiences, after which their worldview is changed. But we do have, <laughs> but we do have a, a general awareness that we're not talking physiology when we're talking conversion experience. And that in some sense, rather than have what we used to be called a psychotomimetic, early term for psychedelics was if you took them in a, a rotten medical setting with horrible people leaning over you saying, are you feeling anything yet? Do you think we're looking at you? <laughs> Which obviously said, ha ha, paranoia. <laughs> what we're finding in a spiritual setting is people have a the equivalent of a conversion experience, but without a religious framework necessarily, and it's one of the kind of most fun areas um, to be able to do research. Because also then we don't have to give people the experience, we can ask them later. Is there a medical model research for microdosing? Um, not yet. Remember, we're dealing with, although some of you may forget this, these are still 100% illegal drugs which have no medical use and an enormous potential for abuse, I'm quoting the federal statutes, and the they are no, they are, let us say that Schedule One is not evidence-based. Since there are substances that are illegal which do not exist yet, which is a kind of either new high or new low for legalization issues. So that the substances that don't exist which have no medical use, etc., etc. So the microdosing um, is an easy one, again, for obvious research if we could do it. Uh, and as I say, people are writing me about their microdose experience, including people saying they don't, it's not for them. So that's, it's always wonderful when you get a few, a few people in your study that don't like it. Because when, particularly when you're working with psychedelics, um, the, the kind of the world, the, the medical and the psychological and journal world just can't stand it, anything that says 100%. Do we know much about the practice of the Nobel Prize winners that uh, made use of psychedelics in uh, facilitating their discoveries? H how exactly did they make use of it? How did they put a topic of interest into the feed hopper of, of the psychedelic machinery? I didn't quite get it. Neil, can you just reframe that? About the Nobel Prize winners who'd used uh, psychedelics, like Crick, I guess, and what, how, they, um, how they used the substance to, for creative purposes. Oh, the creative purposes is basically, this is a 100 microgram dose, and the, the, the variable turns out to be, again, safe, secure setting guides, but the variable is not are you an interesting scientist? But do you care so much about the problem and that you are willing to forego whatever interesting other things are happening with your mind that you're willing to kind of work on the problem? And what we found was the answer was if your motivation was high enough, the answer was yes. And if, you're, if the motivation wasn't high enough, the answer was, well, maybe for a little while. And the way we worked it is three hours headphones, eye shades, music, quiet, lying on your back, and then at the peak, and we actually had people do psychological tests for a little while, and we picked ones that were, you know, that were totally rigid that no one ever changed on, people did of course enormously better, um, but then we said you can work on your problems, and these guys just flew into their problems, and when we let them go for the night, they all went home and worked on their problems till, you know, two or three or four in the morning, uh, because that's what mattered. And our other criteria was that you had to have worked on a problem for at least three months and had failed. So we had both scientific interest, they were being paid for this, this was their job, and they had 
some personal, you know, kind of personal engagement that it mattered to solve the problem. So that's the, those are the variables for scientific problem solving. Now, if you look at what the Dormouse said, the book by John Markoff, which is why did the personal computer happen in Northern California instead of on the East Coast where all the really smart computer people were, his answer was there was a huge overlap between people interested in computer stuff and psychedelics. And so you had the same um, crack young scientists trading drugs at the dead concert. And so that's a different thing and we, we are waiting for biographies uh, rather than research on that because if you just looked at Silicon Valley and, and a number of you have seen something about Steve Jobs and LSD and that he took LSD which helped give him an attitude which most of us who are carrying that equipment on our bodies at the moment are grateful for. Um, he did not use LSD to problem solve stuff at Apple. But don't say anything about that because we kind of like the notion that's going out into the culture that Apple, LSD, yes. <laughs> okay, Question. I think that's probably um, it. Sir. Go one more, okay. Um, in the microdosing experiment, how frequently would you dose yourself? Like what, what would the frequency of dosing yourself in the microdosing experiment? Like, um, I'm, having, I'm having trouble with the acoustics here or my ears, not sure which. The question was, um, in microdosing, how frequently would you take the dose? How, how would what? it be daily? Would it be weekly? Oh, uh, the two microdose studies that I've been watching is every four days, 10 micrograms. Another study every three days, 10 micrograms. Um, a lot of people report, since we're doing kind of research, that you get a two-day event. It's a two-day effect, which given those of you that use psychedelics, particularly LSD, that's surprising. And that the one day not having it is to have a day off. Now, I just got a report from someone who did this for six weeks. And his question, this was an every three day, and his question to me was at the end of the report was, is there any reason to stop? <laughs> and I said, of course, well, when we finish the double blind study with 30 you know, volunteers of your age and body weight, we'll get back to you. But right now, the answer, according to Albert Hoffman, who we think had a no days off, but we don't know, but he certainly suggested now and then, um, that there doesn't seem to be any uh, physiological issues that we've found so far. And again, I do have some reports of people that said, I don't want to touch this. Um, it's either too strong or I have headaches or something. So again, it's really important to keep in mind even that psychedelics are not for everybody. And even microdoses are not for everybody. And that for lots and lots of people, higher doses are absolutely not okay. So, thank you. Well, on that cautionary note then, Jim, thank, thank you. you very much. Please w help me um, thanking Jim for his wonderful presentation.